Okay, for people joining our live stream, this is uh, part of a push to get uh, functions for Wolf Language version 12 finished, and we are looking at geo functionality. Okay, so new core framework. Yes, so we have seen this already. It's, mm, the main thing here was to upgrade geo image and geo elevation data to be as powerful as geographics. So they have many new options now and they can- and, and are those all on the pages and things? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. By the way, when you say aspect ratio of the image, are we saying somewhere that it doesn't distort the image, right? That the final result is a square. So this is the aspect ratio of the projected map. We never, I mean, we never distort the maps unless it is through the projection. We never get right. maps that are squished because the axes are incorrect. No, we don't get that. Right, but should we say that? Um, That's probably pretty obvious. I mean, so long as you give an example there. Yeah, I, I can do that. But the, the idea here was to do what many people requested, which is I want exactly a square map. And that was quite difficult to obtain via geo range, because geo range take, takes into account the curvature. So maps were never exactly square. So, so you see that that map of Cuba is exactly the same one, mm -hmm. except that it has been extended. Maybe we should say aspect ratio of the image area or something. Or aspect ratio of the uh, of the displayed geo region. Yes, of the region in the image, perhaps. I mean, aspect ratio is. Uh... Well, it's ultimately for the image, right? Exactly. Yeah, that, that's that's why I would like to keep image if possible there. So that help, I don't know if that helps. Of the displayed image? Projected image, perhaps? It will be. Because what, what, what we are stressing here is that it is the final projected image and not the original geo range, what is controlled by this. Why don't we say that? Yeah, that's fine with me. Since that's what you just told me. Exactly. <laughs> Um, now, how can there be a background color? Yes, imagine that we have the world in the bone projection. You can try that if you want. So your image of world. Okay, uh, background color. Um, yes, for points. Out, well, um, let's see, what, what should we say? Outside the region specified by the projection? It's, it's outside the wall. It's just outside the wall. So the, our maps will always try to add as much as possible. But if they find the border of the wall, then they have to use the background. Right. Well, do we say that somewhere else? Do we have in geographics? Do we have a, a way of saying this? Um, in geographics, we do have also background. Well, in geographics, we document the geo options, and then we say it also takes the graphics options, which is one of these background. Yeah. Background color. Um, Outside the by world. the way, model of the earth to use? It's not just the earth. It's not the earth, yes. It, it's probably. Yes, yes. And in fact, here we say that birth yes, or other I, body. Mm -hmm. right. um, do we need to fix that someplace else, by the way? Um, Robert, I, I, I will track it down because your model is used in many places. OK. 
Okay. Geo elevation data and all the geo pod functions. Why is this hanging here? That's not a good sign. Dear, oh dear, I'm trying to save that file, so and this is hanging for some reason. <clears throat> oh, come on, what is happening here? Well, that's not a good sign. Boom. Uh, we will have to check whether this worked correctly. Okay, hold on. Okay. All right, so we were looking at geographics and geoimage. Let's see whether the changes we made survive. E yes. Okay. okay, that one did survive. Okay, let's hope this file wasn't corrupted in some horrible way. Yep. Um, okay, so background color outside the projection. I, I would prefer outside the, well, the world, outside the... I th outside the world is just a really weird thing to say, if I might say so. Um, but, I mean, the projection is not something geometric that you can be inside. Outside the projected coordinate system? Outside the projected map. Yeah, that's a good one. That's good. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Why is raster size? Why is it not image size here? Because image size. You can control both independently in this function. Image size is what you will see. Raster size is how many pixels the image actually has. And we should say pixel dimensions of the result. Okay. Pixels. Let's see. Image size. Yes, so that, that's the standard image size. And when you yeah. specify raster size automatic, it takes the image size. Okay. Um, but they can be specified independently. Dimensions of raster for the data or something. Mm -hmm. Underlying data. Okay. Mm -hmm. So this is that. Yep. Okay. Random geo position. Mm -hmm. So that is analogous to random point. Exactly. It's kind of cool, actually. We use it a lot for examples. And, and now the statistics group is very happy with this function. Any reason to keep it experimental? I don't see it. No, I don't think so. It works pretty well. Uh, why did this happen? New and dollar Ember, do we know? I don't know. That should be, can you can you get someone to track that down? Yeah, I'll report it.
This is pretty nice. Okay. And it has Do you have your... back pointers from from random point? Uh, probably not. I typically don't touch the, the geometry functions, but I, I can ask for one of them. I mean, we can do it now if you want, of course. Yeah. I think it should go. After I think it should variant. go there. What's that? After random variate? Yeah. Well, you think it should go there as far down as that? All right, okay, fine. Random geo position. Um, okay. Actually, this should probably point to random variate as well. Yes, you're right. Okay. All right, well, that's super cool. Okay. New yes. options. Yes, so these are the new four options uh, that were motivated mainly uh, by geo elevation data. Looks fine to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is quite useful to get fine control on, on the projection. Oh gosh, this stupid bug again. Mm -hmm. I don't know what that is. It's probably something in the tools. This is very similar to what we've talked about before. Now, when you talk about directions here, what are the what is the meaning of a direction? It's in the geo grid. It's in the grid grid directions, presumably. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, that's all good. Geo resolution. Now, what's the difference in that and raster size? So size is number of pixels. Resolution is distance between pixels, physical distance between pixels. So the resolution is equivalent to a zoom level, not to a raster. Okay, so th there are multiple ways of specifying the final thing. For example, if you give the geo grid range and the geo res resolution, you will know how many pixels you are asking for. So, if I might say so, you haven't mentioned geo grid range here. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah. Actually, it should be probably, yeah, it's a bit both. Yeah. Um, that looks fine to me. Now, what about geo array size? What, what's that? That's yet another version of this. The GRA size is the alternative to raster size for those cases in which the output is an array and not an image. Should we not mention geo array size here? Okay, yeah, yes, I, I, I think if I forgot this one. Okay. Okay, so see also for geo, so that we want to see geo resolution. Well, raster size. Mm -hmm. Geo resolution, then what? Uh, geo grid range. Geo range. And, and perhaps geo zoom level. OK. 
Okay. Now, so geo array size is now an option in geo elevation data, for example. Yes, and in fact, it's the only function that currently has that. But um, I'm going to try to export it to the geo uh, magnetic uh, model data, etc. So you see how many new options this one got. What does that mean, geo model of locations? Don't we want to use a more consistent? Yes, I think this, um, because geo elevation data takes two types of input. It takes the range or region input, and then it also takes a geo position array and returns an array of respective elevations. And I think I had that second model in mind, but, but yes, we should be consistent with the other ones. Okay. Oh, don't tell me this is going to hang again. What is going on here? So we should obviously report this. This is probably some problem with the head, current head branch build. I see. Oh, gosh. This is really frustrating. Mm -hmm. Because you haven't evaluated anything, right? No. Mm -hmm. yeah. Of no great note, at least. Oh, wait a minute, now it now it, it finally did it. Mm -hmm. It's really weird. Something is wrong though. Right. Okay, new okay. extraction methods. Yes, so this is also something that has um, been requested. Easy ways to extract more information from geoposition objects. Yeah, it's a good idea. So now they have methods and it's quite flexible. You can even extract, for example, longitude and latitude reversed because sometimes you need them in that order, etc. Very nice. Very nice. Or, um, you know what else we should have um, is um, <clears throat> latitude quantity or something so that you can extract it in degrees. I see. Yeah, yeah, that's a good idea. Um, it's a bit long, latitude, longitude, quantity is really long, but I think it's okay. Mm -hmm. So we have this two DMS string thing, right? Yes, it's called DMS string, and it can take directly a geoposition. You can do DMS string of here. You can control the precision with a second argument if you want less to use and things like that. Right, and you can get decimal degrees, right? Mm, what do you mean? Well, how do I get decimal degrees? But with a degree, with with degrees. By the way, I saw recently, maybe yesterday, in some situation, I saw a map designation that said NS in EW. Have you seen that and do we parse that? I'm, I'm not sure what you mean. This. No, horrible mess. Where did I see that? That was a map designation oh, I see. for some place. Um, so, so you mean if, if it had a sign it would still say minus 40 and S. To the That's number. right. I see, I see. I see. No, I, I've, I've oh. never seen that. But yeah, I know. I'm trying to remember where I just saw it. Uh, let's see. Gosh, where did I just see that? Um, let's see. Um, Trying to find this. Oh, 
Hold on a second. Um, um, Not sure. Okay. Any case, um, I guess that's a note for the the um, uh, interpretation stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm trying to remember where I just saw this. Uh, just yesterday, what was I looking at? Um, okay. Anyway, I don't remember. All right, let's let's go back here. So now this is for geoposition, right? So if I go to the geoposition function, I've added examples. I don't think I've added a note for this. Surrender on our live stream says that in the geocaching world. I haven't thought about geocaching in ages. Um, that people write coordinates like, for example, this. I wonder whether we parse that. Magnificent. Well, I would say that wasn't a huge problem, unless unless those are are these. Is this a correct parse? Fifty three degrees. Oh, that must be thirteen minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is right. All good. Mm -hmm. Right, we're in good shape there. Okay, let's look at geoposition. I think you opened it. Yeah. yeah. Oh, so you didn't? You don't have a table of these yet? Uh, oh, um, I see. No, no, no. Um, I was thinking of adding a note, perhaps, but I would add a table of all these things that you can do. Okay. Yeah. I'm planning. I'm planning actually to add more. Like, if you have a geoposition array, something that reports how many points do you have inside, and things like that. Yeah, well, what's it going to do if there's multiple things in the geoposition here? What do you mean, multiple? If if the if the geoposition has, you know, many data objects, there are many points. I see. I see. Yes, it, it returns an array, so it returns one for each one. Okay. Uh Okay, so where where are we roughly going to put this? Um, so we're going to say <clears throat> geoposition dot 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 of prop. gives the specified property of a geoposition. Possible properties include, and then we can give at the end the, uh, the multi-case. Mm -hmm. Okay. I don't know why this didn't show up as a red thing. That's really odd. That's probably to do with that M version nonsense that we just saw. Mm -hmm. So I think here we just need to give this this big long list. Right. Um. I, I can do that. I can do this. Okay. Fine. Uh, 
So the, there are respective properties for the four geoposition heads. Yes, so we should copy this this um, the specification into all of those right. and show. Yeah, obviously we should show the examples of what, what happens here. Maybe even one of them in basic examples. I see, I have an example in, in scope. I would give one in basic examples because otherwise nobody knows it's there. Okay. You know, I hate the fact that that time information is an absolute time thing. Yeah, we had this discussion of, I, do you remember that before it was years, but of course, because years are not equal in size. Yeah, that's even more horrifying. I mean, it could be a date object. Could it be a date object? Well, I want this to be, uh, well, it's not packable once we have uh, reals, uh, big nums. Um, are they big nums here? Well, they have to be because otherwise they don't. No, sorry. Well, that that one is right because it is it has too many digits to be a machine precision. Yes. But yes, I think the thing is that when geoposition has an array of points, then it numericizes them. A single geoposition is kept as a big num just in case the precision is useful for something. Okay. But okay. for an array, yes, for it, it needs to be packable. Okay. So, yeah. The alternative here is to use some notion of year which is continuous in size. Like, for example, Besselian year or Julian year, which is what astronomers use. I think that would be reasonable. But I mean, how on earth can we disambiguate that now? Well, it was years until version 10, but it was the wrong notion of years. And then we changed to these in order to make it uh, more precise. Is this second since 1900 or what? This is second, yes, since 1900 in you in 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 Greenwich time. Okay. So the idea of using, for example, Julian years is that we use a counting of years, which is exactly 365.25 days, which is what the Yes, I understand. Mm -hmm. Is there any standard for this in the in the geo world? Or, and, and how will this relate to astro position? Exactly, that's, that's my worry. In the geo world, because most of the computations don't need a very high precision of years, they use years. And they don't worry very much. But I want this to be precise so that we can use satellite positions and in the future we can go. Yeah, but we're going to get messed up with Julian years. If somebody sees something that says uh, 1993 there, but it was actually 1995 because of the you know leap year being off or something, it's going to get super confusing. Y yes, it can get a bit confusing. So what astronomers do is that they use Julian years with respect to for example, now they are using uh, year 2000. And I guess in 2050, they will change to 2050. So that error is relatively small. That is a hack. It, it, it is, but it works for them. So for, for around 50 or more years, it works. So. <laughs> <laughs> Why do I think of the Y2K problem? Yes. So um, that's right. you always have to say Julian Diaz with respect to J2000, things like that. Right. Okay, so listen, this is something we're probably going to want to change once we get astro position really ramped up, but nothing for right now. Right, I agree. Okay, so grid X. Yes, so when we are working with the geogrid position, for example, uh, I want to stress that you are ex extracting grid coordinates, and that's why I put grid in front of all of them. Seems reasonable to me. Mm -hmm. And then we have geodisplacement, which, which has um, now here, we, we can do this exactly the same thing. And remember, we have polar notation. So the first one is distance. The second one is direction. And then we also accept changes in elevation, which I'm calling ascent, and even changes in time. But there are differences in time. So I'm calling it delay. So what do you think of I this? don't like that very much. I think we should call it elevation change instead okay. of ascent. Okay. Ascent is too cutesy in my view. Let's just call it elevation change. Mm -hmm. 
And, and um, time change, time time difference, time difference, time difference. Okay. What? Well, sorry. What did we say? Elevation change. Why don't we say elevation difference? Elevation difference, time difference. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. Okay. Are we on to this stuff now? Yep. Okay. So first there is a diagram to understand what's going on here. This is taken by one of the standard books in projections. So we start with the Earth, and then we approximate by, uh, by the datum. Sorry, I have too many details just in case we have to look at something. Yeah, I understand. I'm just trying to get a sense of what's there. Yep. So we start with the, with the Earth, which is the Earth with mountains and everything. And then we approximate it with a Dayton surface, which is an ellipsoid, and it has the proper size. So this is the, the correct size in miles and correct. Yep. So then we go to something that typically is called the generating globe, which is another surface, but it can be much smaller. In our language, we call it the reference model. So right. the Dayton we typically call the geo model, and the generating globe we call the reference model. And then from the reference model, we go to the map via a projection. And then in the first step, there are no changes in scale. The, the Earth and the datum, they have the same scales in miles. So, okay, but the thing, so geo model is what we've been using to represent the datum, yes? Exactly, yeah. So geo model is, is like a generalization of the concept of datum. Because we can say geo model goes to Pluto or goes to Mars. Okay, so what we don't have is the geo reference model, which is this third level here. We, we do have it. It's an option of the projection. So we always encode that in the projection itself. So a parameter of the projection, uh, go to geo projection data. Or, or here, uh, yeah. Yes, so you see the reference model is one of the parameters there in the. I see. Yes, and that's, there is where we say the size of the reference model. And then the map is of the same size of the reference model, but distorted. And that's why geoscale, the, the scale problems always have these two parts. The nominal scale, which is the, the ratio between the datum and the generating globe, or the reference model, and then the distortion introduced by the map projection. Okay, mm -hmm. okay. So, the, the idea is that for a given point of the map or a given point of the Earth, we want to know what would be the final change in scale of these two things combined. And the, the standard um, way of expressing this was always the size of things on the map divided by the original size of things on the Earth. Yes. And this is... This, this is why the maps say one colon 100,000. But of course, this means that when we are working with maps which are very large, like one colon one million, the, the cartographers call that small scale, which is very confusing. But, and, and then that isn't in fact correct because that one to a million is not, because the thing is not distance preserving, the projection is not distance preserving, that claim about the scale will only be true in some particular place. Right. So when they give the, the, the nominal scale, one to a million, that's typically referring to the first step <coughs> from the datum to the reference model. Then the distortion is always assumed to be something of order one or that, that depends on the point. Okay, what on earth does geodistance scale mean here? Yes, so this distant, geodistance scale means that for Mercator at the location of Copenhagen, and if we go in the direction northeast, so direction 45, then what's happening here is that in the map, sorry, in, in the, in the, um, on the earth, divided by the distance on the map, we have this quotient. So for us, the maps always have dimensionless coordinates. 
So I think sorry, you... divided by. Uh, sorry, I lost something here. Divide that, that. What was the what was the ratio there? It was distance on Earth divided by distance on the map. If you open the page of the distance scale, I have a better example there. By the way, somebody on our live stream is asking about um, eclipses and finite speed of light. You should read the blog, the long, elaborate blog post that I wrote last summer about the total solar eclipse. Um, yeah, let, let's let's go down to the first example. You know, any place where there's that much text to explain what it is. Is a scary thing. Okay. Yeah. So here it is the same example. So we have uh, that the, that's the position on Copenhagen, and uh, a unit of the map. In the sense that if you see the the, the ticks on the map, it's twelve point five to thirteen point five. So that's a unit. All right. That's the geo grid position. I see. That's the right. that is on the geo grid. Yes. So the question is. What's the distance corresponding to one unit of the map? And that's the 38 mile. So if we had to express one of these nominal scales, we would have to say, oh, it's one inch to this number of inches. How do we put that scale on there? Oh, we, geo scale bar. Right. So the geo scale bar is able to put the bar there and it will yes I'm, I'm yes right now your scale bar goes to automatic puts both metric and imperial i'm i'm, I'm trying to convince uh, uh brett that it should be only the one that is determined by dollar unit system yes even more confusingly, one could have a, a map of a part of the Earth that one is not currently in, but I think what it should be where one is currently in that determines the, the uh, unit type. Right, because that, that's the that's the units you are used to. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So. Yes. So, so the summary is: your scale, your distance scale, gives you the scale of a unit of map distance. And it takes into account all the factors involved there. I understand, so, but this goes with geo scale bar. Yes, yes. Geo distance scale. Now, we mentioned distance because there's another one for area. No, but by the way, geo scale bar better be mentioned here. Oh, yes, yes, of course, that's another. So there is geo area scale, which is the very same thing for areas. So, so apart okay, from gives the local ratio. Why don't we say between actual geo distance mm -hmm. and projected map distance? Um, okay. What is this in terms of like like metric tensors and things? Is there an easy statement of it? Yes. So. This is related to a product of the metric and the Jacobians. This gives a symmetric matrix, which is the Tissot ellipse. And then these things are determined by the eigenvalues of that matrix. Hmm. Can we generate the Tissot ellipse thing? Uh, yes. So right now, I'm not exposing it directly. I have an example. If you go to the section in i think it's applications or of geo distance scale yeah yeah further down there is a map look for a little map this one so that's a tissue ellipse and these things are <coughs> yeah sorry are, be, are being determined by by the geodistance uh, scale function 
So the distance scale is basically is is like like the distance from the center to that ellipse. And I'm plotting there the minimum and maximum. Values. I mean, realistically, Brett should have something which represents, like if you're plotting the stress tensor, mm -hmm. right? There is a representation of the stress tensor at every point in terms of ellipses. That's yes. something that is like, like Brett has um, vector plots. He could have, you know, tensor ellipse plots, basically. Yes, it's it's like a symmetric matrix plot. Yeah. You should suggest that to him because that's the generalization. I mean, if we wanted to show distortion on the Earth, we would do it by having, instead of having a bunch of vectors, which would show, I mean, you know, that will show vector flow on the Earth. We could show a bunch of ellipses on the Earth. Yes, the, the easy way to do that for us is to use geodisks. The, so the, the, in the end, these tissue ellipses end up being like geodisks. I see, I see, I see, I see. Yeah, I've seen those pictures, right. Where you have a bunch of geodisks at different... Um, uh, I don't even know how to generate. I mean, there's a somewhat annoying... I mean, geo range isn't what you think it is, so to speak. Geo range is the plot range analog. I mean, there's a... <coughs> A different thing, which would be to put a geo grid to generate a grid on the Earth. I mean, that's an interesting thing to think about: is how would you generate a grid, which is where you know, like you're laying down roads ten miles apart, and you're generating grid of roads. Th that's that's the geo grid lines. So yes, uh, open the page of geo grid lines. I think that's what you are referring to. Yes. And these are always parallels and meridians in any projection. Okay. And then we have the grid lines that would put a grid on the projected. Okay. All right. So the question is geodistance scale. Yes. So to me, the, the simplest this, uh, way to understand this is that when you have a paper map and it says one to a million, you understand it is one inch to a million inches or things like that. But when we have a map on the screen, what do we mean if we don't have a natural size for the map? Then I think it should be one tick of the map goes to so many miles. I find the word scale really confusing here. Mm -hmm. What the heck really is it? It is the ratio of the real distance yes, to, to the map distance. Right. I mean, it's geodistance per unit tick. Exactly. Um, it's a differential, differential construction. And this can be used, for example, to integrate lengths, true lengths, using projected objects via an integrator, things like that. Grid relative geodistance. It's kind of weird. It's a bit too complicated. Well, it's a complicated concept. It, it, it is, it is. Because the issue is that it's a, an infinitesimal thing, yeah. but its divisor is a great big, uh, you know, unit distance on the grid. Mm -hmm. Right. So what will we call this? I mean, this is like a, um, you know, it's like you say miles per hour, but you don't spend a whole hour. You know, you don't have to see how far it went in a whole hour. Right. So what is, well, what about things like, is that crazy? I don't know what, quite what it means. This is the distance element, isn't it? It is similar to that, it, it is related. So the distance element would be the metric. 
Yes. And, uh, and then this is some sort of projected version of the metric. So there is also something generic like geodistance distortion. I don't think that's a good idea. It's not a distortion, it's a number. I mean, it's the, it's not distortion. It's only distortion if you're making it, you know, if you're changing it. Right, but it's going to take a projection. So it, this is in a sense, a description of the projection, a, param a, a property of the projection at that point. Hey, how about this? Geogrid distance scale. Because of the geogrid, it is the distance scale of the geogrid. So you take the geogrid and unit, you know, it's the units of the geogrid. Mm -hmm. And then you ask, what is the scale of one unit on the geogrid? Right. Um, it's true, though, because it's a quotient, what we are returning is a geodistance. So it's like the geodistance of the geogrid distance. Well, then maybe it's just geogrid distance. Geogrid unit distance. Is it that? It says what the unit distance on the geogrid actually corresponds to. Mercator defines a geogrid, yes? Um, yes, yes. I think that this could be explained in the following way. Okay, gives, okay, I'm gonna try it here. Okay, gives the actual geodistance corresponding to a single to a unit distance to the unit distance on the geogrid with projection obtained Corresponds to the unit distance on the geogrid at location well i think this basic statement gives the actual geodistance corresponding to unit distance to the unit distance to a unit distance Can at location lock on the geogrid corresponding to projection proj at location lock in the direction, at, alpha. In the direction alpha. Right? I have a question from the live stream. Do you go over the mountain peaks? No, geodistance is defined as the geodesic distance right. on, the, on the datum. Exactly.
The unit distance on the geogrid obtained with projection proj. Um, how about something like this? The, the thing I'm missing here is either the word local or the word limit. Okay. Perhaps the, the limit gives the limit of off and then we keep everything. Okay, so the actual geo distance correspond to a unit distance on the... Yeah, I understand what you're saying. I think if we just evaluate it as, go ahead. If, if we just say gives the limit of, it, 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 it should, should work. Gives the limit of the actual geo distance. Mm -hmm. Right. Someone on our live stream is pointing out that this might not work for oddly shaped asteroids. We are well aware. This is assuming a, a geo data model that is fundamentally an ellipsoid. And yes, it is complicated enough with that. And yes, we have considered the possibility of other shaped objects represented by other datums. And it is fascinating, but extremely complicated. And the theory of geodesics on arbitrarily curved surfaces is a complicated subject. Mm -hmm. the, um, someone is asking, what's the easiest way to find the angle between two geopars? There's a, there's a function for that, isn't there? The angle between the two geopaths. Well, we would have to start by finding the crossing point. We don't have that yet. Ah. So, if if you have the 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 crossing point, how do you find the crossing point of two lines specified geometrically? I think we added a function for that. Um, I guess it's region intersection or something like that. That's slightly grotesque. I'm going to ask that question. Um, do you mean if you have the formulas? How do you I mean? It no, be... no, no. If you have the line objects. Oh, the line objects. Yeah. I, I, I would guess it's region intersection. Um, okay, but so so you're saying uh, so if if we have the crossing point, then it's very easy because it's just a matter of finding the bearing. Of, of that crossing point to the next point of the geopath for one and another and subtracting the angles. So that's otherwise known as geo bearing or geo direction? Geo direction, exactly. Okay. And now the next question being asked is given three geolocations, that's spherical trigonometry. It's a spherical triangle. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think we've yet dealt with spherical triangles in a nice clean way, have we? Well, um, it's possible to do all the operations if we just specify a spherical datum. That's possible. And then it's pure spherical. So, so spherical trigonometry is a particular case of ellipsoidal trigonometry, which is what we do. Right, but I mean, in the ellipsoidal case, mm -hmm. well, clearly in the spherical case, it doesn't matter where you are. Whereas in the ellipsoid case, it matters if you're on the equator or at the poles and so on. Right, right. What I mean is that we we can describe those differences, um, and we can have a polygon of three points or three geopositions, and it would do the computation. Right, but I mean the the current geometry, the region stuff, does not yet work on curved space spaces, right? Um, right. Yes, you would have to create a two D surface which is curved itself, and then do computations on that surface. Right, I understand. But all the stuff with regions could, in principle, work. I mean, we have talked about spherical position and so on. We haven't implemented that yet, have we? Uh, no, we haven't. But that was the plan, is in addition to having a geo position, to have a spherical position. 
yes. I mean, I know Roger eventually will attack the, 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 the differential geometry cases or, or other cases. Right. But I think, I mean, the, the basic point there, once we have spherical position specified in spherical coordinates, mm -hmm. then, you know, that is somewhat generalizable to ellip ellipsoids. By the time we have bizarre shaped asteroids or, you know, space times and things, then it gets even more complicated. Right, right, yes. That, that. So the simplifying thing in GEO is that we always know we have an ellipsoid. If we go to general surfaces, it's, it's full-blown differential geometry. Right. The question about whether region intersection takes geopath objects, which I bet it does not right now, but it probably should. Y yes, so something important is to establish a bridge between geo and geometry. And now with the new polygons, one, the new polygons with holes, mm -hmm. Working on that's going to be a lot easier, and I'm hoping that we can establish that bridge soon. Right, because the whole the polygons with holes are relevant for geotype polygons. Right? Indeed, yeah. Does that solve a problem of the South Pole or not? No, that's a, that's an independent thing. But um, so what we need is a notion of polygon which is more in, more powerful than the one we have. So right now, the polygon of geoposition is basically assuming that there are no issues um, of, of, of that sort. For example, once you have a, a path on the Earth, it doesn't establish one polygon. It, it, it gives two. You need to know which of the two sides of the path. I mean, if you say the polygon of the equator, which hemisphere yeah. is that? Right. So, so we need a, a new notion of polygon that, that will be a geopolygon based on the polygons with holes that knows on which side of the path you are. Mm. Complicated. Okay. It's, it's complicated, yes. Uh, okay. All right. So let's let's agree on geo geogrid unit distance. Do we agree? Mm. I'm thinking about projected projected unit geo distance so my my only word, I, I like this this suggestion but i'm still worried about whether users will expect the output of this to be a geo grid distance or a geo distance so somehow the, the fully correct thing would be something like geo grid unit geo distance and now you know you take a geo grid thing and you output a geo distance but it sounds too long. Well, but also you're trying to... Uh, I think... I think this is okay, geogrid unit distance. I think explaining it this way. Mm -hmm. You know what? I don't think we should say the limit here. I think this makes it very confusing. I think we should put the limit in a different place. It gives the actual geo distance corresponding to a unit distance obtained with projection evaluated in the limit. Okay, evaluated in the limit of approaching location log from direction alpha. It's not from, they got the sign wrong then. Um, the distances are going to be positive in both directions, but. Okay. Or, or evaluating the limit of leaving location log in direction alpha, something like that. Okay, evaluated um, in the limit of infinitesimal I, I wouldn't say infinitesimal I think in the limit of moving from of displace this we have geo displacement so perhaps this is uh, in the limit of small displacement yes exactly from location log in direction alpha. 
Okay. Yep. Okay. Fine. All right, we can do the rename here. Okay, geo grid unit distance. Okay, mm -hmm. should we leave this experimental or should we just make it? Um... Well, what the function does is pretty well defined. The, the only thing which was problematic is the name. So, all right, fine, let's do factorize it. I, I, I think it's fine now. <clears throat> the second line, I'm not sure whether to force the users to write min max as third argument, and then they can do max or min, things like that. What do you think? Sorry, for this last thing here? Yes. So perhaps we can have three arguments always, and, and if the users want min max, they should write comma min max. I think they should write comma and max. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm thinking that as well because it gives more flexibility of writing now mean, max, and this sort of thing. Right, I don't think that's right for that. Yeah. Okay, good. So there is, yes, yeah, so the Spanish, I have to simplify all of this. Right, well, hopefully the new name will help. Yeah, I think so. Okay, so geo de, geogrid unit area. Mm -hmm. Same deal. Exactly. It's the same thing. What was it called before? Geo? Geo area scale. All right. Yeah. I can also transfer the description. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm not going to wait. Spent the whole. I'm just getting the satisfaction of changing the name. Yeah. <laughs> um, Geogrid unit area. Oh, great. Okay, and defuturize. And then there is a third one. Oh, no. Okay, <laughs> what is it? Yes, which is the direction. So the, the three things we are always worried are distance, area, and direction. And currently, I was calling this, um, but but now, now we have the way to call it. I was calling it geodirection distortion, but now it has to be geogrid unit. Um, well, no, it's not unit. It's not unit anything. Right. It's, we could call it geogrid direction difference because now now this yes difference. yes that's right geogrid direction difference mm -hmm. it's the difference between the directions on the geogrid and the directions on the earth exactly exactly so the, oh. if, if two directions were originally perpendicular and now they are not it will give you the difference by which they are not perpendicular right now uh, distortion Okay. All right. So that's getting renamed. Geogrid direction difference. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. and we'll defuturize, and you'll fix up the details of this. Right, exactly. Okay, great. Good, and um, and then we have the the vector families, the, uh, the vector objects. So these are like cousins of geopositions, and uh, they have exactly the same structure like the four geoposition objects, so they are the four geovector objects. And because they are geometric vectors, they always need to know where they are. 
So the structure is location arrow vector. And a vector is specified as length m mm -hmm. bearing alpha. Exactly. So, but that's related to geo displacement, isn't it? It's 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 a different concept, but very uh, related. Yes. Okay, we should call it the same thing, dist comma alpha. I think here. Well, but it's not a dist. For example, imagine that we are, we have a vector which is a velocity, an acceleration. Oh, flow of people. Boy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's why I'm, I'm I'm being very general in saying modulus only. I think you could say length. But for for vectors, we don't say length. We say norm or modulus. I think L length. If, I mean, would you say a length of so many miles per hour? Size. Size is, is okay. Okay, but but basically this is a vector. Yes, it, it's a vector which is defined by its uh, norm or size and the angle with respect to north. That's the geo vector. And then you can have the geo vector E and U object which will give, you can give three projections to the E and U axis. Yep. And then you have the geo vector X, Y, Z, in which you also have three projections, but now you're projecting on the axis of the Earth. So that's good, for example, to compare vectors in different positions because you are converting them into 3D vectors. So wait a minute. If you want to know for a plane, so... You're going to give the instantaneous velocity vector of a plane in different places, right? Exactly. And you need to, to know which frame you are using. For example, typically, you expect that it will be given with respect to north. And then if you are given a, 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 a 10 miles per hour or 100 miles per hour and uh, 30 degrees, it's your vector. But if you are saying, if you are given five, uh, 50 miles per hour north, 60 miles per hour east, then it's a geo vector E and U. Someone on our live stream is pointing out that the obvious name for this is magnitude of the vector. Yes, yes. It's that sometimes we avoid magnitude because it seems to represent quantity, and this can be numbers. But yes, magnitude is fine. Yes. Yeah, bearing is hardly the. Um... We can say direction. We can say asimius. These are the three names. Direction would be fine. It says that direction is a bit more as cartographers would use more. I, I think bearing is right because it's relative to north here. Right. Mm -hmm. I think we could get away with saying magnitude here. Mm -hmm. And then I don't have to change the M. Indeed. Um, okay, so let's imagine you're doing a, um, so are we going to generate for the wind, for example? Exactly, in, it's, it's already done. So what happens? So perhaps there's an example further down in, in, the, reference, in the reference page. So wind data and wind vector. What is this incredibly ugly object here? So, so that's that's a dart. So that's a dart and a circle, and it's representing the. I think it's precisely wind direction. Can you go a bit up? Yeah, but but, but did we get graphic design to look at this because it looks horrible? Um, no, sorry. No. Well, let's do that, please. Yes, yes. So yes, you you have the wind vector data, and it returns. You can ask for a geo vector directly and gives the magnitude and the bearing, 50 degrees. Okay. Okay, so then, so if I want to integrate, for example, over, you know, the plane, well, I don't even know what that means. Okay, so if the plane is in a certain bearing relative to the 
I'm so confused. Um, so the important thing is that people can now specify vectors just by giving a bearing, for example, and then in every projection they will have the correct orientation. That's what that's what I'm trying to represent in the map. Right. I have to disappear actually now, um, but I think we've made good progress here. And I yeah. guess tomorrow we have some stuff with GeoVector plot. Exactly. We, um, we can continue the discussion with GeoVector with Brett tomorrow. Fine. I will push all these changes. And um, thanks to folks on the live stream. And um, uh, see you all soon.